again. Hi, I'm Tim again. And uh, Nathan, just to warn you, I had one job up here and I missed the tape. So if this is off kilter for the online people, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, hey, we are continuing on in our series, Real Talk, and we will be talking this morning about psalms of disorientation to bring you up to speed. We are talking about uh, the psalms in this series, and there are three kinds of categories of psalms, uh, and those are psalms of orientation, which we talked about last week, this week psalms of disorientation, and then next week will be psalms of new orientation. And those words really have to do with our posture, our perspective in life, in relation to what we believe and what we see unfolding in our lives and around us. And so when, when life is of the orientation posture, things seem to be going along as they should based on uh, what you believe. But in Psalms of Disorientation, as we're going to look at this morning, uh, things become, to use the word, disoriented, chaotic, difficult, troublesome. They become filled with struggle. And, and so the question becomes, you know, how do we respond in our faith? How do we relate to God uh, in times like that? And I, I thought the best way to start things off was uh, to tell you a story about Skyline Chile and the time when I first started to learn to pray. When I first came to faith, I was a teenager. I was in my, in, you know, 16, 17 in that ballpark. And uh, I, I grew up and lived on the east side of Cincinnati, about 30 minutes from downtown uh, in Amelia, Ohio. And uh, when I came to faith and I was a part of the youth group in my latter years of high school, we would often do church together. And then as a group, we would go out to eat afterward on a Sunday. And we had the same eating spot every week, the Eastgate location of Skyline Chili. And I started to learn something as I was, I was new to faith, and, and I'd be there sometimes uh, uh, our youth minister or sometimes youth leaders uh, in, in the church would be there at lunch with us. And so when you're new to faith, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up doing church stuff, so, you know, it's Skyline in front of me. I'm, I'm going to dig in. And I realized that you don't just get to dig in just because they put the plate in front of you. You got to do something first. You got to pray. And when, when, I was, when I was new to faith, I, I would start to pay attention. Well, how, how, how do they pray? You know, you become interested. You're like, I want to pray the right way. I've not done this before. I'm going to emulate the leaders in front of me in how to pray. And I remember a very distinct prayer it became almost a repetition every time we were at lunch. And it went something like this. Dear Lord God, thank you for this time together and thank you for this meal you've given us. And I want you to catch this part. Please bless this to the nourishment of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, that's right. I didn't learn the Lord's Prayer at Skyline Time. I learned that one. Now, as I went on, I started to emulate that and pray that prayer, either silently or if we were in a group, I, I would do that. And as I started to grow in faith and I started to read Scripture and I started to study, I, I realized I started to alter that prayer a little bit. I, I, I cut a part out. I started cutting out the bless this to the nourishment of our bodies because it hit me one day as I'm staring at my spaghetti Filled with skyline chili. Yes, it's chili, not sauce. Anyway, I'm, I'm a Cincinnati. And a mound, a heaping mound of cheese overflowing off the plate. You know, they give you the plate that's the size of the three-way they give you and then a plate under it because they know it ain't going to stay on the plate. So you got you to toss it onto the larger plate. They basically give you a large... Anyway, I realized suddenly that God is fully capable of turning that delicious lunch into the nutritious equivalent of broccoli. <laughs> but I'm not sure he's going to 
because I'm the one that elects to continue to go eat at this location and this particular food. You know, it's a humorous example, and if you still pray a prayer like that to this day, I mean no offense. I think it's a wonderful prayer, and you should continue doing it. But the reason I share this is because as I learned uh, in my relationship with God over time, and as I, I studied, I realized that God wants us to come to him as we are in honesty, and, and life has highs and lows. And they have st struggles of big and small varieties. And I think you may not pray that prayer at a, like a skyline meal, but I'd venture a guess that if you're anything like me, you learn to relate to God in ways that make navigating life's difficulties a bit of a conundrum as you are praying and relating to God. You might be afraid, I'm going to say the wrong thing and make God mad at me. Or maybe you think to yourself, these struggles are too small and, and God is so big and why would he want anything to do with these? Or you might think, you know, I've been praying about this for a long time and I'm, I'm not getting the response I want or any at all. And I wonder if I should just clam up and stop. And that's where the Psalms of disorientation can be super helpful to us as followers of Jesus. And if anything, this morning, I hope to make the case that it's okay to experience the disorientation and chaos of life and go to our Heavenly Father in honesty and truth about how we're dealing with it. And I'm not just saying this on the basis of my feelings, but I'm going to approach it from what the Psalms say, what Jesus does in response to one of his disciples, and even when we get to communion today, how Jesus himself prays to the Father when his hour has come. Now, I told you about a silly prayer and how I dealt with that at Skyline. Let me tell you about the most real prayer I have ever had in my life. And I apologize. I've worked in two different churches. This is the second one. And I'm also pushing 40, and I think that I'm starting to tell stories on repeat sometimes. So if you've heard this before, my apologies. When we were in the hospital uh, to have Leo, uh, many of you have heard me say before, my wife is a type 1 diabetic. It made her an immediate candidate for being induced and a surefire candidate for a C-section. But, of course, you know, our, our doctor and medical team wanted to, you know, try to not have to go those routes. But as things are progressing along, they started to notice that Leo's heartbeat was kind of blipping on the radar along the way. And so they started talking about C-section. And we eventually had to make that decision. Uh, now, when we were there, you know, they, they're first deal is to prep the operating room and then they come in and they get they get Angie ready to go and they and they wheel her out and they hand me uh, some I'm pretty sure extra large scrubs and a hat which I probably didn't even need a hat it's not like I would have anyway I'm, I'm joking about the hat part but they just hand me these and they say all right you wait here we'll come get you when we're ready and, you know, I, I've heard that in medical situations, they're able to go really fast. And, it, and it, in real time, it probably was pretty quick before they brought me back there. But it didn't feel quick to me. All of a sudden, I went from my wife and our baby waiting in the room together for this joyous occasion to come to all the beeping devices 
and IVs and my wife and said baby and medical team gone. And I'm there alone with my thoughts. And as I've told you a billion times over, I'm an anxious person. So in this moment, I decided I need to pray because I was getting nervous. I was getting nervous because my wife was going to have an operation. The heartbeat was blipping. She's already a high-risk candidate. And all these things are going on in my mind. And so I just start praying to God. And I have not forgotten exactly what I said to God in the moment. What I told God then was I said, God, my wife just got wheeled back, as you know. And right now, I don't want some life lesson from a bad situation as much as I know you want me to grow and teach me. What I actually want right now is a healthy mom and a healthy kid and I'm not going to shut up until I get it. And we were blessed, and that's what happened in that moment with a healthy mom and healthy kid. And let me tell you that since I do what I do for a living, I've been in many situations where I've met parents and children and grandparents and, and many people over praying in similar circumstances where they didn't get the answer that they wanted. And so that moment wasn't lost on me, which is why I got really real in the moment. But I knew that God was big enough to handle my bluntness in the moment. See, oftentimes when we learn about prayer relating to God, we learn about being reverent, reverent, reverent. Is that a bad way of saying revelation anyway? Sorry about that. We learn about being reverent to God. And we, we throw in the word Lord 50 million times in between every word that we say because we want to make sure we've said Lord enough to address him properly. Or maybe we want something specific and so... Rather than just saying what we want, we, we throw in the if you wills and, and, and all those different things. And, and those are all good. In fact, as we're going to see from Jesus at the end today, asking for God's will to be done is a good thing. But as we'll learn from the psalmist, and if you read the Bible, if you read Lamentations, if you read the book of Job, you will find many instances where the people of God come to God in the rawness of the circumstances of their life and they lay it all to bear for him and he can take it and in fact often he admonishes them for it go ahead read the end of the book of Job Job's still the good guy even after you know all the stuff he goes on anyway that's another book for another day so you're thinking okay well that sounds great but where's the scriptural evidence? Well, it's found in Psalm 42. That's our psalm of disorientation today. It's one that I know that there's a, uh, a, uh, a song or hymn. I don't really always, I didn't grow up in church, so I don't always know the difference between which ones were hymns and which ones were Chris Tomlin songs. Uh, so, but I know this one turned into a song at some point. Uh, so you may be familiar with this psalm, and if you're not, that's okay. You can, you can dive in with us here. But it's Psalm 42, and it starts at verse 1. It says, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God." My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your torrents. 
All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. This psalm, the specific person behind it, we're not certain of. You know, there are some psalms of David. And then in this particular case, uh, this, uh, this is from the Korahites, and, and so we don't, we're not given the, a particular name, but for lack of a better term, the psalmist here is giving words to God and prayer through song in a situation of distress, which is interesting because when we looked at David's psalm last week, it was also a distressing situation. And yet, what we see are two different ways of, of handling these distressing situations. Last week, because of the orientation of David and the, the posture of things and the understanding of faith, he gave us a psalm of confidence. Not confidence in his own might, but confidence in the God whom he serves and loves. But in this particular instance, we see the lack of confidence, not in God, but in the individual psalmist. A lack of confidence in the sense that the psalmist repeatedly says, why is my soul downcast? I don't know if you caught this, the, the Hebrew in this psalm here, there's actually a word that is, is so rare, this is the only instance of it, and so it's uncertain what it even means. So translators had to reconstruct by context, and the idea that's happening here is that the psalmist is saying, hey, I used to, to lead masses or throngs of people to the place where God resides, and we used to worship loudly. So why is it someone like me can go and, and lead masses to God in awe and reverence and praise and yet in this moment of despair be so downcast? And as the psalmist asks these questions, uh, we get two water-related instances here, which I think is important to point out because, well, we have a tendency to take water for granted in our world in ways that those that lived in the biblical world did not. If you're thirsty, you go home and you turn on your faucet and you put a cup under it and you turn the faucet off and you take a drink. And hey, you want some relaxation in the heat? Go to the pool. Better yet, go to the beach. Experience the waves. Catch the sunlight. Build sandcastles. Avoid sharks. <laughs> but for the, the biblical author here, number one, drinking water, clean water, safe water, that wasn't going to make you sick was a little more difficult to come by, a little more scarce. There had to be more work to go into finding something safe to drink. Furthermore, the sea, the ocean, was a scary place. It was chaotic. It was scary to be at sea, especially if the storms came. And so with that worldview, that perspective in our minds, we see an instance where the writer says that as a deer longs for flowing streams to, to take care of thirst, 
My soul longs to God. My soul thirsts for God. For someone that truly knows what thirst feels like, given their circumstances, this is a profound and powerful statement. To bypass the physical feeling of thirst and to say that they're longing for God's presence, which clearly they're not feeling in the moment of their distress, is like the need for water. The psalmist goes on and says his tears that are like water coming from the eye are about all they've got for food. They're in so much distress that they can't stomach eating. All they have to live on are tears even though their soul thirsts You see the play on water here? But there's more to it. Because later on, he says this phrase, deep calls to deep at the thunder of your torrents. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. This statement, deep calls to deep, is referring to the depths of the sea, but also the the depths of the sky that produces rain and storms. And in both instances, especially when these two depths join together, it becomes a very scary proposition for people in this worldview, in this time. And the experience is so challenging that it is like the chaos of the depths are surrounding and bearing in on them. This person is in a very, very bad way. And he's wondering aloud in this psalm, where is God's presence in the midst of my suffering? Why am I feeling this way when I have been able to lead the charge in worship to God? The psalmist might even have asked themselves, where is my faith? But what they do in fact ask is I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Which is the ultimate statement of disorientation. Because I don't know if you know this about God, but he's all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present. God knows the numbers of hair on your head For some, it's easier to count than others. But he knows. So how low is this psalmist that he would ask, why, God, have you forgotten me? Here's why. Because the circumstances are so difficult that that's how he feels. You know, uh, that, that child that I told the story about uh, just turned four this last week. And I have to admit also that, that we have been blessed with a kid that on the whole sleeps pretty well. But every now and then he'll go through like week or two long phases where like every other night we get no sleep. As I'm sure any of you with kids have experienced moments like that. And Leo has been, as of late, fixated on the functionality of smoke alarms and asking how they work. And then he also asks about why God created us in the same sentence about the smoke alarm, which as a theology student, I don't even know how to answer. So he's above me. But I'll tell you this. With his state of curiosity occasionally comes nightmares. And nightmares wake up children at just the wrong hours, like 3 a.m. And even though as parents we just want a good night of sleep, we have told Leo, if you get scared, just tell us and we'll show up. And so if he gets scared, if he has a bad dream or he thinks he's heard a smoke alarm going off in his dream, 
he will yell out. Or sometimes come quietly to the bed and startle you and there's a face right in front of you. (laughs) But we want our son to be able to tell us what he's feeling, when he's scared, when things are difficult, when he can't get his Legos to stack the way he wants and he gets frustrated and starts breaking them. I want him to be able to express maybe in, a, in healthier ways, but I want him to express his anger around us. Why? Oh, because I love my kid. And I want him to know that he can tell us what's going on. Jesus once said, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more Your Father in heaven knows how to give good gifts to you. If I am capable of loving my kid and being there to let him share his frustrations and his fears and his his sadnesses to me, how much more our Heavenly Father can take on my stuff in the moment. Even if what I say to him isn't always in line with what is actually true about him. Like, I don't know, a God that is not going to ever forget his children, and yet, if I feel distant, I can say, why have you forgotten me, God? Why? Because our Heavenly Father wants us to relate to him. Because if we keep dressing up our prayers and our concerns with niceties, eventually, you know what we'll stop doing altogether? Praying. We'll say to ourselves, this isn't working. I don't know if he cares. I don't know if he's listening. So I'll just stop. And you know, I don't know if you know this, but if you stop connecting with someone you supposedly have a relationship with, you don't have a relationship with that person. God wants our all, our highs and our lows, and he cares. And he'll even take our tantrums because he's big enough to handle them. I want to, I want to, read you one of my favorite gospel stories. It comes in the gospel of John. It's at the end of chapter one. It's, it's when Jesus calls both Philip and Nathaniel. And I want to read this story to you to see how Jesus responds specifically to Nathaniel. It's, it starts in verse 43 and it reads as follows. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now here's why I like this story. I don't know if you caught this, but Nathaniel straight up dissed Jesus. <laughs> He got really, really mean-spirited. He basically finds out from, from Philip, 
that Jesus resides and comes from Nazareth. And so his response is, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? When Jesus sees Nathanael, he says to him, ah, here's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And then he goes on to say that he saw him under the fig tree, which this is a big deal because there was no one around Nathanael under the fig tree, which is why this astounded him that Jesus would have known anything like that about him. But it also implies that Jesus' initial words to Nathanael means that Jesus knows that Nathanael's kind of a bit of a skeptic about who Jesus is based simply on where he resides. You know, if we're all honest, we've all probably had some sort of stereotype or prejudice that we've thought about other people based on how they look, where they come from, and all that stuff, and that's exactly what Nathaniel's doing to Jesus. And do you know what Jesus does? Well, I'll tell you first what he doesn't do. He doesn't say to Nathaniel, how dare you insult me? You can't be my disciple. Depart from me. I never knew you. No, he engages him. He gets past the insult. He shows him exactly who he is. And even when Nathaniel comes to the right conclusion about Jesus after that erroneous, prejudiced one, Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, oh, you believe because I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see even greater things. I'm not just going to have you follow me despite that little remark you made. I'm going to let you see things that you can't even imagine yet. I'm going to take you on the inside. You're going to get to know me, and I'm going to get to know you, and you're going to be my disciple. Jesus, the Son, resembles the Father in this moment. Nathaniel insults, and Jesus repays the insult not with a stone wall, but with open arms into his inner circle. Why? Because God is big enough to deal with our sin, our brokenness, our shame, our struggles. And he wants us in relationship with him despite them. Psalms of disorientation help us to see that in relating to God, we don't just have to dress everything up with the right words, and we definitely shouldn't run away from God and give him the cold shoulder when things are going tough. But to realize that real reverence to God is to recognize his grandeur and that he can take on all of those things that we carry within us and on our shoulders and we can bring them to him and he will not turn away from us. Each week we take communion as a church family. I hope that when you came in today that you got a communion pack. One of my favorite New Testament stories is the story of Jesus at the Mount of Olives. He asks his inner three, Peter, James, and John, to come with him as he goes to pray because his hour's at hand. He knows what's coming. He knows he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, that he's going to go through a sham trial, that he's going to be handed over to the Romans to be crucified. And along the way, as he took his disciples on, showing them the kingdom and teaching them the ways of the kingdom. At different points, he would stop and tell them, uh, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Gentiles and be crucified. But on the third day, 
rise again. Jesus knew the outcome after the outcome, and he trusted in the Father for that plan to unfold to fruition. And yet in that moment at the Mount of Olives, when his three closest friends can't keep awake because it was too late at night, they had worked too hard, they had heard too much, they had walked too far, that Jesus in his pleas to get them to stay awake eventually realizes he's on his lonesome. And he prays a prayer to his Father in heaven. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, please take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Even Jesus, when his hour had arrived, the thing he came to do, the thing he warned his disciples was going to happen. The trust in the Father that he would not remain in the tomb but be raised from the dead on the third day. And yet he still knew the torture, the hardship that he was going to face. And in his moment of being fully human and fully divine, he prays to the Father and asks, that he would take this cup from him. One last time, which I can only imagine that it was always on his mind, and he probably prayed that before that point. Does it have to be this way? Do I have to go through that? Do I have to be arrested? Do I have to be tortured? Do I have to go to the cross? Father, please take this cup from me. Jesus had a heavenly Father that he could be honest with when he didn't want to face the torment at hand he asked that it be removed and yet when it was apparent that it was the only way he still went to the cross for us we serve a God who loves us so much that he not only cares for our concerns and our struggles, but when we take communion, we remember that he does something about them through his son Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many. So I'm going to ask that you take a moment to contemplate and consider God's love for us as evidenced by his son Jesus and after that moment of quiet, we will take communion together as one church family. I invite each of you to take the bread from this cup and eat. This is his body which is given for us. And in the same way, I invite you to take and drink from this cup. This is his blood which is poured out for us. Please pray with me. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you for being a good and gracious God who can bear our burdens, can handle our shame, 
who made a way despite our sin to not only be made right with you, but to be in relationship with you. And even though your son Jesus took care of our sins once and for all, we still know that we struggle daily, that we experience hardship in life, and that things in our lives become disorienting. And God, I pray that you'll help each of us remember that in the highs and the lows, we can turn to you like children to a father, knowing that we are safe in your arms, knowing that you can take our burdens, our anger, our sadness, and that you love us in spite of it all. Help us to remember that not just as a nice reminder, but as an encouragement to continue to come to you each day so that we can glorify you in all that we do. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.